one question I'm going to pose, and then I'll I'll throw it open to the uh, to the audience. Um, you know, it, uh, if I use Iran as an example, Iran, I think it's fair to say that since the revolution, uh, the influence of clerics in the older sense, that is, in the, that people would voluntarily follow them and they looked towards them as being sort of icons uh, and leaders of, of, of religious and, 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 and intellectual thought has uh, diminished noticeably. The clerics actually are less and less important inside of Iranian society. They are not more important. That the revolution has, in many ways, uh, diminished them. Now, <clears throat> I would have had expected that uh, Saudi society, which is similar to Iranian society in, in, in many ways, I mean, Iranians are a hell of a lot more fun. She are always more fun than Wahhabis. But, um, that uh, that the influence of the clerical class, the the concern of the state with uh, you know for uh, commanding the good, forbidding the bad, is 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 similar. That we would have seen inside of Saudi society a moving away from uh, clerics as being uh, important and pivotal in intellectual debates. Um, Yet, you don't get that impression. And I'm wondering whether that, that the impression is, in fact, false, uh, whether there's more there. And as Mike said, because Saudi society is so opaque, vastly more opaque than Iranian society, which is probably, uh, at least until the coming of the Arab Spring, the most loquacious of all societies uh, in, in the classical Middle East, uh, I wonder whether that isn't also true in Saudi Arabia. And I also it would extend it and wonder whether the clerical class as a class is in fact losing influence throughout the entire Middle East and whether their conversations may be becoming more intense amongst themselves for the very reason that they are losing followers. Now, the, the Twitter you know, issue would, in, would indicate that maybe that view is wrong. Uh, but again, I, I don't really, I'm not sure, I, I, know, I know what Twitter really means. I don't know what it really means in the United States. Uh, and I, I don't know, I certainly don't know what it means uh, in the Middle East, what, what it really is indicative of. But I just throw that, that thought out, that question out of uh, what really is the influence of, of clerics now in Saudi Arabia? How broad really is their following? And how many people really do pay that much attention to them, or whether they ha are in fact suffering a similar fate to what we've seen in Iran, where a smaller and smaller and smaller audience really looks to them for that much uh, that much guidance, at least beyond you know ablutions and what you can eat or what you cannot eat or when you can have sex or not have sex. Well, I think I can. Uh comment on that a little bit. Um, the distinction between Iran and Saudi Arabia in terms of um, uh, influence of clerics, first of all, is that the Shia faith is much more structured in terms of issuing fatwas. Um, they have mullahs who are recognized by the state um, whose edicts are binding. Um, such authority does not exist in Sunni Islam. Um, uh, basically, a fatwa is a relig religious edict um, that speaks to uh, a moment and a situation specifically. Um, I will make, uh, I like the analogy of uh, saying that the, the fatwas and the religious opinions, um, analyzing them is like analyzing um, um, uh, judges' opinions um, because they are specific uh, to situations. Now, um, saying that, um, they still yield, the Saudi clerics yield a lot of their um, authority from um, Mecca being the center of the Islamic faith. So it's not um, a de facto religious authority over all of the Muslim world. It is out of respect um, and um, that, that uh, uh, people outside the Saudi Arabia pay attention to what, to what um, Saudi clerics do say. But I would just I would just say I mean we certainly have seen in the last uh, 25 years an explosion 
of thought was that you might, it's a bit of misuse of the word, but the democratization of the fatwa process in, in, the, in the Sunni world is just utter chaos. Uh, and it's a big issue. The Saudis have obviously tried to, uh, you know, pull in and, and limit this, this chaos. Uh, but again, it reemphasizes the point of, of how influential is, uh, is, is this process given that it is becoming ever more democratized uh, and ever more chaotic. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to weigh in on that for a second. I, I think actually what, what we picked up was is that, yes, there's a huge amount of traffic out there and there's a lot of noise. And um, not all clerics are created equal, not all fatwas are created equal. And so what we saw was a, a, a core cluster of, uh, of clerics, and we mentioned them um, in, in the study. Uh, there are a handful of them, five or six, that really account for the bulk of the traffic, the bulk of the discussion, uh, and the bulk of the influence. And so I think you've probably got a lot of other people who probably would love to get into the game. Um, I mean, it's, I would say that in the, at least in the online space, um, you know, not all websites are as heavily trafficked. Um, you know, not all publications do, you know, are people going to read. Some are more popular than others. What's happened is, is that these clerics have uh, have developed a, uh, a cult following. I think it was Muhammad Al Arifi who was uh, described as a rock star uh, in in one of the uh, in one of the publications that we were reading. Uh, he's got 1.6 million uh, followers, and and that's that's legitimate. He's people care what he has to say, um, and. So, uh, you know, but I think you're right. To a certain extent, there's a lot of noise out there. But if you can focus in on the areas that we really tried to, to, to look at, the, these few clerics that really account for a lot of the clout, um, I think, you know, you can get to the core of what I think is, is potentially a problem and potentially, um, you know, some good news, depending on how you want to look at it. All right. I'll throw it open to questions from the audience. Since I think Simon had his finger up first, I'll go back to him. Uh, thank you. Uh, Simon Henderson, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Um, I was wondering when we were going to get to Iran, and I'm pleased that Michael got there in the end, and I'm pleased that Royal uh, got there in his first question. Um, my working assumption of Saudi Arabia at the moment um, is that uh, at least the, uh, the royal family is much more concerned about Iran uh, than it is the Arab Spring, and its uh, principal irritation with uh, Washington is uh, they think Washington's got it the wrong way around. And in the period that you particularly looked at, the first six months of last year, slap bang in the middle was the Saudi intervention in Bahrain. Uh, and uh, I I'm curious to know what you found uh, to be the extent of uh, the religious, uh, Saudi religious support for the action of their government and uh, the extent to which it mirrored uh, Riyadh's view of what is going on and where is this going? And if I could squeeze in what is potentially a last question. Since uh, on I normally don't like the American style of multiple questions when you're asking questions. Uh, you seem to have adopted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is, um, since we're bothered about Iran as well, at least I think we are, uh, what can we do to make uh, use of um, uh, Saudi uh, uh, electronic fatwas uh, to um, help uh, our policy on Iran? Sure. Um, well, in terms of, uh, of the Bahraini issue, um, we certainly uh, saw a fair amount of traffic. Uh, and as could be expected, we saw the sanctioned clerics uh, supporting the action there. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think there was, uh, when we talk about discussion, right, because it was not just the clerics themselves and what they issued, but then there was the reaction to uh, their rulings or, or their discussions by their followers. And uh, I would say that uh, there was some heated debate over whether uh, Saudi clerics should be wading into this issue. Um, and in fact, uh, was it Al-Oda who talked about uh, not treating uh, Shia brethren in the, uh, or deriding them in the way that uh, um, 
that uh, some of the clerics had. Uh, so in other words, there was some discussion there about whether this is the right way to be treating uh, Shia either in the eastern province or in Bahrain. Uh, but broadly speaking, what you saw was either um, you know clerics weighing in on behalf or uh, you know if, if clerics <coughs> perhaps were undecided, they didn't weigh in at all. And I, I have a feeling that this issue is probably one of the red line issues um, by the state because we didn't see a whole lot, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I can't recall more than a handful of, uh, of comments by you know clerics, if in fact any, that said we shouldn't be involved in Bahrain, we should get out, or we should you know uh, we shouldn't be intervening. I don't know if, if the two of you have <coughs> anything else to add. Uh, no, definitely nothing that says we should get out of Bahrain. Um, it's interesting interesting to know that I've been following them on Twitter and Facebook, you know, since the study, and and I see they're still they're still keeping up the pressure. Um, on you know on their followers to support the the Sunni government in Bahrain, and you can also see them fighting against the Iranian uh, interests in Syria. I mean, almost all of the clerics now wholeheartedly are advocating uh, jihad in Syria. Months ago, um, a, a cleric I mentioned, Idol Karni, like 1.1 million Twitter followers, he he called for the death of Bashar al-Assad. Um, you know, and they continue to to talk about the conflict in very sectarian terms. You know, describing the regime as a, as a rejectionist, which is their term for the Shia a rejectionist. Um, uh, you know, like Farsi alliance. Um, so, um, yes, their their views uh, very clearly, I think, reflect the the feelings among the Saudi government. Uh, you know, and the animosity against uh, Iran in that instance. Uh, just a, a couple of quick comments. Um, the, you remember, uh, Simon, you remember well the, um, the fact that there were protests in the eastern province in support of the Bahraini oppo opposition. And I think the, the regime in Riyadh noted that well. Um, uh, that the worst protests they've actually had have been Shia rising up um, you know, basically in opposition of the Saudi policy in uh, Saudi Shia rising up or, or going out in the streets at least to protest the um, the Saudi policy in um, in Bahrain uh, and that and there were there were um, steps that the government took to try to I think um, uh, mobilize some sectarian feeling inside the kingdom um, against the, against the in in favor of the Saudi policy in in Bahrain I I for one don't know um, how strong on a popular level, the anti-Shiite feeling is in in um, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and that's one of the areas where you realize that you come up against the um, the gap between the the, the 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 computer screen and what people actually feel on the ground. I'm not saying that it's that there isn't strong sectarian feeling on the ground. I just don't I just don't know. It's very strong among the clerics, for sure, and it's a it's a basic principle. And I think one thing that needs to be re remembered is that. If there are equal rights given to the Shia, it's not a Wahhabi state anymore. Uh, I mean, the clerics, the clerics own a portion of the state. They own justice. They own education. They own a bit of the police, um, uh, and so on and so forth. And if you open the system up, and you allow the Shia to, as the as the Saudi clerics say, openly manifest their heresy, uh, well, then the 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 the, the Wahhabi clerics don't have a they no longer have a monopoly on the on the on the pieces of the state. That they currently own, um, and so they're going to fight just from a bureaucratic point of view. In a sense, they're going to fight that one uh, to the um, to the death. The um, your question, Simon, about what can we do? I I don't know that we can really um, uh, we should really pay too much attention when formulating high policy to um, to the to the debates, the the Islamic debates. I think it's the kind of thing that we should be aware of. And we should have a kind of sense of where some of the red lines are that we might um, uh, that we might run up against, um, and maybe we should we should have some awareness at some level of our bureaucracy about Islamic debates, so that we can take up positions in a totally non-religious language that could be easily supported at times by uh, by strongly felt positions um, in in the Islamic world. But in general, I think um, we just have to follow our interests. And the, the the Saudis know how to. They know how. They have a whole clerical class there that that uh, that puts out the Islamic arguments to support their interests when they decide to move this way or that way. So we should just leave that side to them. I think. Um, I'll look, um, on the Bahraini issue, um, the 
a sanctioned cleric did exactly what's expected of them by um, rubber stamping uh, what uh, the um, monarchy in Saudi Arabia um, uh, wanted them to do uh, by basically supporting um, the regime in Bahrain and uh, claiming that um, revolution or the unrest in Bahrain is caused by Iran intervention. And it linked um, it directly to a conspiracy by, by the Shia to topple a Sunni regime. Um, that uh, the reaction from the Bahrainis was um, Sunnis supported that argument, but the minority uh, highlighted the hypocrisy of s such arguments because some of these clerics spoke against, supported the Tunisian uh, revolution or spoke against Gaddafi, but at the same time they would say that the Bahraini um, uh, revolution is a different kind of revolution and it's illegitimate because it's caused by um, a minority of Sunnis that want to disrupt security. I think it's always good to remember that the old uh, name for the eastern province was Al Bahrain. The Saudi family certainly always remembers that. Uh, Lee? Hi, Lee Smith, FDD. Uh, question for Michael Duran. Um, you were saying before, uh, before, your, uh, before your prepared, or b before your remarks, that you think the Salafis don't represent a strategic threat to the U.S. Do you, and, but then you also sort of describe the Salafis as a, a broad current. Do you mean all the way from the Salafi sheikhs to the bin Ladenist element to the Muslim Brotherhood? There's no strategic threat to the U.S. from any of the Salafi trends? Right. If you, if you define a strategic threat as something that um, is a, a direct threat to our vital interests, um, our vital interests being free flow of oil at reasonable prices, uh, W, uh, countering uh, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, um, countering uh, terrorism with global reach, and um, supporting Israel. I don't think the, um, the the rise of the Salafi trend that we've seen in the um, in the um, Arab Spring is a strategic threat. I don't see it threatening any of those directly threatening threatening any of those issues and, and that's because mainly because of the uh, the fragmentation within the move if you call it a movement within the within the movement um, and because the center of gravity at the moment is really uh, in the argument between them about power and authority in their in their societies Hassan, did you have a question yes actually um, first of all it's uh, I thank you very much for a very interesting study that I think documented uh, what is uh, a first and a paradigm shift almost that was brought by uh, the Arab Spring, which is indeed uh, in terms of the debate within Salafism between uh, jihadists and loyalists, with the activists being social activists, the Dawiyya. Indeed, what we have what we have witnessed is uh, uh, the, the rise of uh, political Salafism in Egypt and its impact on Saudi Arabia. I think you you do an excellent job of transforming ideas, if you'd like, uh, uh, theories into in verifying them on the ground. But I do have a metho methodological question here, in terms of the selection of the universe that you study, because I have the impression that uh, 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 both Facebook and Twitter are being solid outfits. I mean, are easy targets, while the four Forums, which I understand you did look at, are far more fluid and therefore far more interesting. And those, if if taken, if the context is set uh, a little bit wider, we have both uh, more sobering and maybe more uh, softening trends. Because we have, on the one hand, an, uh, if you'd like, a disproportionate use of the forums by jihadist elements. But we also we also have, uh, I mean. Uh, um, a reconception of what the Saudi internet scene, if we take into account that there, there are liberal forces, there are gay, Christian, and rap, actually rap is a major element in terms of uh, not just pornography, but also rap, which actually merges the two, because in rap there's a lot of pornography there. And if you take all of that into context, all of a sudden the numbers, even for in, on Twitter and in, uh, in Facebook, of following the clerics, there's a lot of tokenism. I follow Okra Lasfour and Clash al Wash, and therefore I have to follow Al Arifi okay, yes. in order to balance it. But I do not listen that much to. So, a question of methodology. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, as Jonathan said, this is, this is uh, strictly a snapshot. And um, then again, we're not um, 
uh, looking at the uh, internet environment as a whole, we looked at messaging specifically related to Saudi clerics. So the numbers you see um, do not have to do with the entire environment and all the other issues. It is specifically related to clerics, messaging about clerics, and their fatwas. So if you uh, research wider, you would see some of those elements. And even in the web forums, we have seen some radical forums. Um, what we've noticed is that um, the tone of, of, of the forum kind of sets the content. So radical um, users go to radical forums and liberal users go to liberal forums. Um, but to go back to the, your original point, this is strictly about Saudi clerics. Yeah, uh, just to uh, just to put a finer point on that, um, you know, when we initially set about to conduct this study, you know, I mentioned earlier we could have looked at you know just what was in the media in general. We could have looked at the wider blog universe, and there is a rather significant one. Um, and but you know, again, what we were trying to get at here was just ten years after 9/11, does the problem of Wahhabism or the radical strain within Wahhabism, if you will. Does it still exist? Is it still a problem? And that was the that was the primary research question here. Um, I think what you suggest is uh, is a fascinating um, idea. If we were able to expand it out, um, maybe you can help get us funding, and we can uh, we can take a look at uh, at another study. I think that I, I lost track of the question right there. Uh, hi, oh, like this? Yeah. My name is Andrew Buckwack. I'm with the American Islamic Congress. I have a question for Yusuf, or Yunus, excuse me, sorry. Um, you talked a little bit about evaluating the tone of the statements about essentially from moderate to militants, I believe is what you said. Right. Did you also look to see if there was any kind of a relationship between the tone of the statements and then the resonance of those statements? Like, are we finding that more extreme tweets get more retweets? And then just in general for anyone, is there any kind of a relationship? Are there other factors that influence the reach or the resonance of the statements you looked at? Thank right. You. I touched upon that briefly. I said that um, sort of the, the, the venue sets the tone for the conversations. Um, uh, radical websites, which were scored as highly negative, tended to carry more negative uh, conversations, while um, you know, more moderate platforms um, uh, attracted uh, more moderate users. But in terms of comparison between social media itself, you, you found that um, less radical messaging is uh, floating through Twitter. And that has to do with demographics and who is using um, these platforms. Younger, uh, more, and, and again, we're talking about the um, period where the Arab revolutions were going on. Um, enthusiastic youth were um, making efficient use of, of, of Twitter, for instance, to put out very liberal messaging. Just a, um, an additional um, note on the whole question of sentiment. Um, I think I should note that we had a very difficult time just wrestling with the very question of sentiment. Uh, it's a sliding scale. It's a very kind of strange spectrum. What some people consider to be radical may be considered conservative in other circles. And so we kind of tried to put these in buckets just to get a better sense of what was going on. And uh, platforms weren't necessarily all radical, although I think, as Eunice seemed to suggest, some of them, you know, um, had a, maybe an overriding, um, you know, um, uh, um, you know whether it was radical or whatever, you could get a sense that it, you know that they fell into one bucket or another. But the one thing that I think we found very challenging was um, the clerics themselves um, would embrace um, varying. Um, sentiment themselves. In other words, you could have some people who would say, you know, death to uh, death to Israel and Jews are the descendants of monkeys and pigs, but yet we embrace democracy. Well, where do you put them on that, right? I mean, how do you, how do you actually, you know, how, how do you describe them? And so we, we tried not to rely too heavily on the sentiment angle on this. I mean, when we talked about, you know, how an overriding uh, or a majority of the numbers, you know, 75 percent of the, of the things that we mined had some element of intolerance to them, we were very careful not to say that they were all radical, right? It was just these were of concern. So just a, a point to make here, it's, uh, it wasn't exactly cut and dry when we look at sentiment. And I would just add about your uh, the question about Twitter. I mean, it's not that um, more extreme messages get retweeted more often, but it, it happens that, you know, if a cleric uh, for example, says something you know that inflames sectarian tension in Syria or something. You know that might be retweeted by his followers that agree with his views. That, you know that he's anti-Shia. Um, so you know, uh, basically, how it went in the forums that 
you know moderate uh, you know moderate opinions would be followed with you know moderate responses. It I think that also followed on Twitter, um, and you know and obviously the more the more extreme answers got extreme responses. Um, you know pray, uh, um, you know uh, messages like chronic messages, you know got um, obviously positive responses from from Twitter users. That's how it went. Um, I always like to emphasize that when one dealing with the Middle East, you have to have sort of extreme elasticity for contradictions. Uh, I always like to remember that it was quite common in my former life when I would be uh, uh, running Iranian agents and I'd be with the uh, Iranian agents and uh, we would often have digressions about how the CIA had cocked up the Middle East. Uh, and I would say, do you perhaps see any contradiction between that statement and the fact that you are, in fact, working with CIA? <laughs> and uh, they would, of course, see no contradiction whatsoever. Uh, so just you always have to keep that in mind, I think. Uh, they have a, there's a larger uh, gray area there than, than we usually have. Uh, there's another question out there anywhere, right here. I wonder, Sushman, I wonder if you could talk about the censorship uh, that you saw what were you able to capture uh, things that were censored before they they were, and how quickly are things being censored? Um, let me say this: I, I don't think we were able to watch in real time censorship taking place, but we were able to watch in real time the reaction of the Saudi regime, um, or within a day or so, understanding what the ramifications were of somebody who crossed the Saudi red lines. So, for example, there was one cleric. Um, uh, a, a, a prominent sanctioned cleric who declared that um, uh, the what was it the owners of uh, satellite television stations that uh, that uh, broadcast Western and and um, otherwise unacceptable material um, that they should be killed or that the station should be destroyed well, that person was immediately fired um, another cleric that called for um, prisoners um, who were being held without reason to be released um, got a visit from uh, the Saudi security. Uh, and was not to be heard from again for quite some time. So you're able to see how if they messaged in a way that crossed the Saudi red lines one way or the other, either uh, getting too radical, right, and sort of putting egg in the face of the Saudi regime, that was unacceptable, or challenging the state itself. Either way, you saw the, you know, a relatively immediate reaction. But I think, I, and if you guys want to weigh in on this, I, I, I'd be happy to hear what your thoughts, but I think in general what we saw was this self-policing. In other words, everybody understood what they could and could not say, and most people found a way. In other words, okay, you still harbor radical sentiment. Well, you know you can't call for jihad anymore. The state has made it very clear since 2004 you can't do that, but you can still, you know, um, deride Shia. You can still talk about Jews as descendants of apes and pigs. You can do all these things without saying, now let's go to war. Again, the numbers there were less than 5%, and that is the thing that the Saudis have been very careful about, and I think will continue to be given um, the deep crisis. And, you know, I mean, this was a crisis that lasted for a very very long time after 9-11 as a result of what we uncovered uh, coming out of, of Saudi society coming before that. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, I, I want to echo the self-policing thing. I think that's the way it usually works. Everybody knows where the, where the red lines are. Um, the, the most interesting guy in, in that regard is uh, Salman Alauda, I think, because he is always, uh, he He's working for the regime in a sense. They, they're, in, they're in close contact with him. Uh, and they see the value in having a guy with an independent reputation who takes positions that broadly um, legitimate them or support the positions that, that they're taking. But he often, he'll often stray beyond the boundaries of what's acceptable. And they, they slap him around a little bit. And they, but then he'll also let his audience know that. Um, uh, and, and again, it gives him credibility. But there's a, it's a, it's a complex dance between uh, between him and the regime. Just one, one uh, point on methodology. <clears throat> um, when I, I was trying to make the point before about center of gravity, uh, which, is a, which is something that I think you can only um, establish through art and not through science or statistics. So you can say you have a, a cleric uh, who takes a really strong position on how horrible the Israelis are and how, um, uh, and how um, or the Jews in general, and how deserving they are of violence against them. But if you look carefully at the universe of his positions, you might find, for instance, that he is also the guy who said that it's unacceptable for a Saudi to go fight the jihad in Iraq, 
and also the Saudis shouldn't be going and fighting the jihad in, in, in Palestine. That that's really up to the um, that's really up to the Palestinians to fight their jihad and the Iraqis to fight their jihad. So, if you if you have a, a kind of um, a, a black and white notion of what's a moderate and what's an extremist, you can you might take some of his statements about Israel and say he's in the extremist realm. But when you look at what he's actually advocating doing. He's not, he's not saying go fight at all. And in fact, some of that extreme rhetoric that he's, that he's directing at the Jews is really to try to cover himself for the, for the, for the really soft position he's taking on, on other things. That's just, that's just one example, but you can only figure that out, I think, by really following the debate and knowing these, these characters. And sometimes, as Ruel said, it's just hard to figure out how come this guy is here on this position and, and there on that. Uh, do we have another question? I think this is probably going to be our last question. In fact, I'll take two questions at once because I see them right together and I couldn't possibly discriminate. So I'll take that question right there and then from the young lady right there. Uh, hi, I'm Zach Fisher. I'm here with the Jewish Policy Center and this is sort of uh, to piggyback off of uh, Mr. Duran's point. Um, when the un are the unsanctioned clerics in uh, Saudi Arabia, are they calling for conventional warfare against um, Israel and against America, or are they uh, only calling for acts of jihad? And uh, an additional question to that, is the era of conventional warfare over, at least uh, in terms of the Islamic world? Next question. Take them both at one time. Well, it's pretty much from the same role. I'm uh, Natasha Mosgovay from Haaretz newspaper. I was just wondering if uh, uh, refer referrals to Israel are indeed marginal, or there, are, uh, there is some concern that uh, should be that deserves uh, follow up. And uh, I was also wondering if uh, there was some reaction from the Saudi authorities to, to the study, or it wasn't shipped to them anyway. Uh, who would like to start here, gentlemen? Uh, Mike, or you want to answer the first uh, question? Uh, yeah, I just want to first. Thing I wanted to clarify that uh, I was just giving an example, um, which I pulled out of my head, um, about about how it's difficult to um, to categorize people on the basis of a position that they've taken on this or that issue. Um, some of these guys really do care about Israel and are saying uh, it, it, uh, and are and are supporting violence against it. Um, and um, I think that uh, that is a, an ongoing concern. And the, the, the place where, where it needs to be watched the, the most carefully is, of course, in Sinai. I mean, as, this, as this debate among Islamists in, in Egypt heats up and as security in Sinai um, uh, deteriorates, it's easy to imagine a scenario where, uh, where somebody in, in Egypt decides that it's in his advantage to have the border with Israel heat up. Um, against the background of this fight between Islamists. So just because the Islamists are arguing with each other uh, doesn't mean that um, it's good news for the Jews, uh, I guess is the way I would put it. Um, on on, on the, um, the other question, I forgot what that was. Convention, oh, conventional war. Oh, conventional war. No, I don't, it's, not, it's not over. It's not over. It's just that right now the focus uh, is really on, on the, the, the internal debate. That's in my view, and that's where the, that's where the center of gravity is. These other issues are going to continue. Uh, Al-Qaeda or the, the strain of, of, uh, of jihadism that Al-Qaeda represents is not going to go away. But the interesting thing here is that it's been kind of pushed to the margins. Right? It didn't carry out revolution in Egypt, which it wanted to do. It didn't carry out revolution in Iraq. It probably won't carry out, uh, um, I, I'd be willing to bet anything, it's not going to carry it out in Syria. It, it, it's, it's extreme violence allows it to take root only in places where you have uh, completely failed states or, or somewhat failed states like Somalia, Afghanistan, Yemen. It'll still be there and, and, there will, and it, will, it will intersect with some of these debates in, the, in these other places. So it's, it's, it's not a total good news story, it's just a little good news story. Uh, as for the conventional war, uh, whether or not clerics are advocating it, I, I haven't seen that. It's been, you know, straight straight up jihad, but that messaging has been pretty marginal. I mean, uh, I really haven't seen them commenting on Israel uh, that much at all. Only, you know, it only comes out when there's some kind of a flare-up in, you know, uh, intentions between Israelis and Palestinians, um, or or if they're asked a specific question, you know, if they, you know, they issue a fatwa against it. Um, but uh, as far as reaction from the Saudis, um, about a week after our study came out, so this is uh, last week or a week and a half ago, um, there was a, 
it was reviewed in the Saudi press um, in Arabic. And shortly after that, I was uh, browsing through Facebook, uh, and I noticed that uh, this most popular cleric we've been talking about, Salman al Auda, had uh, had posted the review of our study to his Facebook page, uh, and that was also you know connected to his Twitter page and to his website, Islam Today. Why wasn't that sent around? Huh? Why wasn't that sent around? I didn't get to see that. I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Join him on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Become one of the 1.1 million. <laughs> so you know, so as much as we monitor them, they you know they also uh, are aware of what's going on. They're very keyed in, and you know they know that we're monitoring them, um, and you know they keep up with they keep up with the trends in in uh, Western in Western thought about them. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Steve. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, discussion uh, about uh, Israel with relation to uh, messaging um, related to Saudi clerics. Again, uh, we had a section for, for military which dealt with uh, jihad issues, and uh, both in Arabic and English space, it occupied very uh, small proportion of uh, the entire discussions. But obviously, whenever uh, um, Israel came up, it was almost always on a negative tone. Just, I guess, a parting thought here as, as we wrap up. Um, you know, the, the way that the study was conducted, um, you know, again, I think we found that uh, the, the overt radical um, or the calls for jihad are, are, are really, uh, they've diminished significantly. Um, but we see, you know, continued problematic proclamations against Israel or, you know, uh, against minorities or against women. And these are things that are of concern. What I noted, uh, or what I, we were sort of thinking about this as the um, as the Arab press began to pick this up, and unda undoubtedly it, it did sort of pop up on the radar of the Saudis, is, um, you know, they will continue to need to to um, to temper their, uh, their radicalization problem. And I am sure that they looked at this and said, well, wow, this is a great tool for us to get a handle um, on, uh, on, on whether we have a problem or not. And so initially, while, while I thought that they may have been un unhappy with what we've mined, um, to a certain extent, I think it helped shed light on you know, how they're dealing with the problem, because I don't know whether they have metrics. Uh, in fact, I would argue that probably most people don't. So um, we're hoping that this is a useful thing um, for everyone. And we hope that this is intelligence that uh, if other people, again, pick up on it, it can be used alongside uh, of other streams of intelligence to get a better picture of what's happening in a very opaque society. And with that, uh, I will call it to close, and I hope everybody had a good time. Bye.